Hey guys, welcome back to our uh, pharmacology review, and uh, today our discussion is going to focus on uh, asthma and uh, COPD. So we started putting a few questions into our uh, discussion, and the goal of these questions is to get you thinking about integrating pharmacology and uh, uh, pathology and histology and physiology, um, because the test questions on step one uh, is kind of different than your exam questions, where they like to integrate a lot of uh, different subjects together. Um, so um, I'm just going to read this first question, and you know you can kind of think about it uh, a little bit later. Uh, but a 55 man with a significant smoking history complains of dyspnea and productive cough for one week. Exam reveals wheezes and prolonged expiratory phase. Uh, hyperresonance to percussion in a barrel chest. The patient is afebrile and has a heart rate of 105. The physician describes a commonly used medication in hopes that it will help to alleviate this patient's symptoms. Um, one week later, the patient returns to the office with recent onset of tremors and feels as though his heart is racing. In addition to counseling the patient, what additional tests should be ordered? So here, the question is really um, a few step questions. So the first thing is for you to recognize what disease uh, is being treated here. And it'll give you, um, it's giving it to you uh, in terms of here wheezing, expiratory, prolonged expiratory phase, and hyperresonance to percussion. And then you have to understand what is the first line treatment for that disease um, because the physician prescribed the commonly used medication. Um, and then the third uh, the third step is understanding what is the side effect of this uh, disease, uh, what are the side effect of this medication. So here um, it's saying that the patient has recent onset of tremors uh, and feeling that his heart is racing. So that is the side effect of the medication. And then fourth step is um, recognizing how to uh, sort of monitor or treat these side effects. So this is what it's called the multi, multi-layered question. And really the goal for you is to integrate a lot of things together. So um, the options is chest x-ray, uh, basic metabolic panel, urine tox screen, complete blood count, and blood cultures. And I'm not going to answer these questions because we'll kind of go through it later. Uh, this is a similar question that's integrating um, pharmacology with physiology and uh, mostly histology. Uh, so you can read that and answer it at your own uh, leisure. So with before I before I start uh, our discussion, I always like to give a big picture of what is it that we're trying to achieve here. Um, so when we talk about asthma and COPD, there's really a couple problems. Uh, the first problem is in asthma, there is uh, it's triggered, uh, triggered by either smoke or dust or running or exercise. Uh, but the biggest two problems is bronchoconstriction, and the bronchoconstriction is reversible. And there's also airway inflammation. Um, in COPD, which specifically uh, refers to emphysema and bronchitis, there is airway obstruction uh, because it's an obstructive air disease. Uh, and there's also inflammation, but the airway obstruction is uh, more than the inflammation. So when we talk about these problems, the bronchoconstriction and the inflammation and the triggers, we're going to talk about how to fix it. So the first problem, the bronchoconstriction, uh, how to fix this, the bronchodilate. And you're going to ask me, how do we bronchodilate? Um, so the first thing that we we need to understand is that the bronchoconstriction is dependent really on the parasympathetic nervous system. So parasympathetic leads to bronchoconstriction. So if we want to bronchodilate, we can activate the opposite of that system, which is the sympathetic nervous system. And we can give medications like the beta agonists, the short-acting beta agonist and long-acting beta agonist, to uh, activate the sympathetic nervous system. And these work in the beta-2 receptor. Uh, the second thing that we can do to bronchodilate is that we can inhibit the parasympathetic nervous system. And that's using muscarinic antagonists. So these block the action of the parasympathetic nervous system. And the third thing that we can do is that we can increase cyclic AMP. And if you remember cyclic AMP, if it's increased, uh, it causes bronchodilation. And that's using a drug called theophylline. So that's the first step in fixing the problem in, in asthma and COPD. The second step is to decrease inflammation. Well, you're going to ask me, how do we decrease inflammation? Um, and how do we decrease it is 
um, that we can inhibit arachidonic acid synthesis and prostaglandin synthesis. And if you remember from our discussion from our first exam, that um, synthesis of these uh, two leads to inf inflammation. And how we inhibit it is through oral or inhaled corticosteroids. We can also block leukotrienes. And if you remember, also leukotrienes is a product of that uh, of one of that pathways, and blocking that is through anti-leukotrienes, mainly Montelukast. And the third thing that we can do specifically in asthma is that we can minimize triggers. So how we minimize triggers is that we can block um, the um, the IgE from binding to mast cell. If you remember, uh, mast cells uh, release histamine and they cause bronco, uh, and histamine causes bronchoconstriction. And how that happens is that there is the uh, antibodies bind to mast cell and tells it to degranulate. So we can block that uh, action. So we can block the IgE from binding to mast cell. That's through a drug called omalizumab. And then we can give another drug to stabilize the mast cell, uh, and that's called chromolin. So that's really the big picture. Uh, bronchodilation, decreasing inflammation, and minimizing uh, triggers. So the first class of drugs that we're going to talk about is the beta agonist. And the beta agonist is divided into short-acting beta agonist and long-acting beta agonist. And that's according to its half-life. So the short-acting beta agonist, and remember, it's beta 2 because um, it's exists in the liver. I remember it's just beta 1 is in the heart, there's one heart, and beta 2 is in the lungs, uh, there's two lungs. Uh, the prototype for the short-acting beta agonist is albuterol. And how it works is that it's a beta 2 agonist, then it relaxes the bronchial smooth muscle leading to bronchial dilation. Um, it's used. How is it used? Do you think it's used in acute asthma or chronic asthma? It's an acute asthma because it's a short-acting medication. So it's acute asthma and COPD uh, due to its short uh, half-life. Uh, mainly, this is an inhaled medication. So it's giving through, um, through either an inhaler where the patient... Uh, uh, inhales through the puffer or nebulized where you there's this machine and kind of breaks it into smaller particles and you put it on the mouth of the patient and it goes uh, through their lungs. Or you can give it orally. However, oral is uh, less effective and it has a lot more side effects. Uh, which brings us to our next point, the side effects of the short-acting beta agonist or the beta agonist in general. So I don't like to memorize things, I just like to try to understand it. And really the side effects is dependent on the effect of the beta uh, receptors. So the first side effect that you're gonna get is anxiety and tremor. And the reason for the anxiety and tremor is because there is beta two receptors on the vasculature that kind of uh, cause uh, fine motor uh, movement uh, that causes to that causes the uh, skeletal muscle to to tremble. Um, uh, short acting beta agonist or albuterol can also cause arrhythmias because it's beta. Uh, there is beta one receptors in the heart, and if you give it in big enough doses, uh, it loses its selectivity and it causes uh, arrhythmia and tachycardia. And the last thing is that it can cause hypokalemia. And the reason for hypokalemia is kind of interesting because there is beta receptors on the sodium and potassium ATPase pump, um, and if you activate these receptors, it's gonna drive potassium into the cell um, and uh, cause hypokalemia. So if you understand these concepts, you can actually go back and answer this question. And I'm trying to do this exercise just for you to understand the layers of this question. So here, we understand that this patient has asthma, right? So the p physician describes a commonly used medication in hopes that it would alleviate this patient. doesn't really um, uh, give us much, but we know that most likely it will be a, a beta agonist. Uh, one week later, the patient returns to the office with recent onset of tremors and feels as though his heart is racing. And we understand that uh, a beta agonist cause tremors and cause uh, tachycardia and, and arrhythmia. Uh, in addition to counseling the patient, what additional tests should be ordered? So I hope that you uh, uh, that you can uh, figure out the answer. And the answer is that you can get a basic metabolic panel. And the reason for that is because uh, short-acting beta agonist can cause hypokalemia, and basic metabolic panel can give you the counts for the potassium to make sure that it's not uh, too low. So the 
that kind of gives us the understanding of the short acting beta angle. Sorry it took a little bit long, but you know, I wanted to drive home a point that uh, most of these questions on step one is multi-layered uh, questions. Uh, next is long acting beta two agonists, uh, LABA. Um, and the prototype is for metorol and salmeterol. The mechanism of action is the same as the SABA. Um, it's used for chronic asthma, not acute asthma. Remember, they're long acting, so we don't use Need to use it for patients that are acutely deteriorating. We use it for patients that have chronic asthma or COPD. The one thing that I want you to remember about long-acting beta agonists is that they're most of the time, um, actually all of the time, they're used in combination with inhaled corticosteroids. The reason for that is because when they've used it alone, they found in clinical studies that they're an increased risk of death. There's really no explanation that I can give you for that, but know that if they're used alone, they cause an increased risk of death. Uh, these are inhaled medication and have the same side effects as the SABAs, but to a lesser extent. Continuing with our uh, bronchodilation theme, so the uh, beta agonist cause bronchodilation, the muscarinic antagonist also cause bronchodilation. And the muscarinic antagonist is divided into short-acting and long-acting. The short-acting prototype is called iprotropium, and that blocks the muscarinic receptors, aka the parasympathetic receptors, uh, preventing the parasympathetic effect uh, and leading to bronchodilation. Um, the muscarinic antagonist, uh, they are usually combined with albuterol for acute asthma and COPD exacerbation. The first line is really albuterol. The second line for acute uh, is um, ipro iprotropium. These are inhaled medication, really don't have uh, a lot of side effects. Um, long acting for the muscarinic antagonist is teotropium, has the same side effects, and it's used for chronic COPD treatment. Now, why is it not used in asthma. Um, it's it's really less effective in chronic asthma, and we don't really understand why, but for teotropium, if you have a, a test question that's asking, what is teotropium used for? It's used for chronic COPD treatment, and this is an inhaled medication. So we talked about our first goal of uh, decreasing uh, bronco uh, constriction by uh, beta agonist and anti-muscarinic. The second goal is to decrease decrease inflammation. And I wanted to put this slide to remind you from the first exam of how inflammation occurs. So first, it really starts from the membrane lipids uh, that's uh, uh, getting attacked by uh, white blood cells or neutrophils. Um, that leads to uh, this enzyme phospholipase that degrades the membrane lipid, leading to arachidonic acid. And arachidonic acid uh, kind of takes this pathway of uh, the leukotrienes or this pathway of the prostaglandins. So if you want to de decrease inflammation, specifically in asthma, you can take one of two routes. You can block this. Uh, you can block phospholipase A2 by corticosteroids, or you can block the leukotrienes uh, by the leukotrienes uh, antagonist. So the first class of medications that we're going to talk about as related to inflammation is corticosteroids. So uh, corticosteroids come in two flavors, either inhaled uh, or systemic. That means you can give it orally or through the IV. So the first one that we're going to talk about is inhaled corticosteroids. These uh, uh, prototypes are budesonide and fluticasone. And how they work is that they inhibit phospholipase A2, which is the beginning of the inflammatory pathway. And that leads to inhibition of prostaglandins, interleukins, and that really decreases uh, inflammation. Um, do you think corticosteroids are used in acute asthma or, uh, sorry, do you think that inhaled corticosteroids are used in acute asthma or chronic asthma? They're used in chronic asthma, and the reason for that is because um, they're really not as effective as uh, oral agents, uh, oral uh, corticosteroids for acute uh, asthma uh, treatment. So they're used for chronic asthma and COB COPD treatment, uh, and they're not used for acute management. And really, they're uh, they can be used alone, and they can or they can be combined with a long-acting beta agonist to kind of give both. Uh, the effect of bronchodilation and decreasing inflammation in, in one drug. 
Um, I want you to be aware of the side effects of the inhaled corticosteroids. There is really two side effects that I want you to be aware of. The first one is patients can get oral candidiasis or thrush. And the reason for that, if you remember, corticosteroids decrease the immune, uh, cause sort of uh, immune deficiency and decrease uh, uh, neutrophils uh, migration into the side of uh, inflammation. So when you have that, you can have overgrowth of candidiasis and that manifests as uh, oral candidiasis. So we instruct patients who use inhaled corticosteroids to rinse their mouth after use, and that is also a high yield point for examination. Uh, the second point is that it can cause hoarseness because it can irritate uh, the vocal cords. Uh, second, um, subtype of or second flavor of corticosteroids is the systemic corticosteroids. So mainly prednisone and methyl uh, prednisolone, but there is a lot of other ones. These are the prototypes. Has the same mechanism of action, and these are used in acute asthma and COPD exacerbation. Um, the reason we use it in acute asthma and COPD exacerbation is not to bronchodilate, but because we know that there is so much inflammation, we give it for the hope of in the next 12 to 24 hours that it's going to start uh, working. So its effect is not evident immediately. Um, systemic corticosteroids have a lot of side effects. And this brings me to a good um, sort of point to review the systemic side effects of corticosteroids because they are very high yield. They'll show up on um, on maybe your block exam, but they'll definitely show up on uh, step one uh, questions. So I broke it up according into sort of uh, system. So cardiovascular systems, steroids cause salt and water retention. And the reason they do that is because they mimic aldosterone uh, effect. Uh, endocrine effects, they cause Cushing syndrome. So they cause redistribution of the body fat and the lipid dystrophy. So all the buffalo hump and the moon faces, uh, they cause hyper hyperglycemia because they increase uh, insulin resistance. And the most feared complication of corticosteroid is adrenal insufficiency, um, aka hypothalamic pituitary uh, adrenal access suppression. And the reason for that is because when you give steroids for a long time, the adrenal glands kind of um, atrophy and there is um, less uh, ACTH, uh, ACTH release. So the system kind of uh, quiets down. Um, if you take away uh, the uh, the steroids, the uh, I think of it as the system kind of sleeping, and it takes a, a very long time to 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 wake up. So you don't have adrenal stimulation when you take away the uh, the steroids. This really happens for treatment longer than ten days. So patients will need their dose tapered. So if you start with like if you're giving a patient a fifty milligram dose, you can't cut it right away. You can give them 40 uh, for a couple of days, 30 for a couple of days, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, this um, adrenal insufficiency presents as hypotension and shock during stressful situations. Uh, and examples of stressful situations include surgery or infection. And there are so many questions um, that um, can kind of uh, hint to you, uh, will tell you a patient is on, let's say, prednisone for rheumatoid arthritis or lupus or something, and uh, the patient is coming in to you and their blood pressure is 70 over 40. Uh, what could be a cause of their hypotension? And the cause would be adrenal insufficiency. Uh, next side effects is GI side effects. It can cause peptic ulcers because uh, steroids decrease GI protective uh, prostaglandin release. Uh, neuro side effects, it can cause psychosis. Um, eye side effects, it can cause cataracts. Uh, immune side effects, it can cause poor wound healing because they decrease fibroblast activity. And uh, they also cause immunodeficiency because they block release of a lot of uh, the prostaglandins um, in the leukotrienes and IL-2. Uh, they also decrease white blood cell uh, adhesions. And lastly, there is bone side effects. They cause osteoporosis because they inhibit osteoplasts and they uh, cause uh, avascular necrosis of the femoral head. And that's a feared, one of the feared, uh, it's rare, it's rare, but it's a feared complication of uh, steroids. So please review this because it's very high yield and understanding this will serve you in the long run. So uh, coming back to our discussion, so we were talking about uh, steroids and how steroids can 
uh, be used to decrease uh, inflammation in asthma. The second way that uh, we can decrease inflammation in asthma is through blocking the leukotrienes. So if you remember, leukotrienes cause inflammation and they increase the bronchial uh, constriction. Um, how they work is uh, they really uh, block leukotrienes. Uh, they work in two different ways. The first drug is called Montelukast, and that blocks the leukotriene receptors. So you have the leukotrienes being made, but they don't bind to the receptor. The second medication is called Zilutone, and that's a lipooxygenase inhibitor, and that blocks the conversion of arachidonic acid to leukotrienes. The difference between these two drugs is important because there will be questions that will ask you about the different mechanism uh, of action for these medications. Uh, it's used uh, uh, for specifically for really refractory asthma, but um, aspirin-induced asthma and exercise-induced asthma. Um, and I wanted to take a point and talk about why leukotrienes is uh, used in aspirin-induced asthma. And I believe I might have covered it in exam one. So uh, when you give aspirin, you block COX-1 and COX-2. So if you block uh, COX-1 and COX-2, you're going to block the prostaglandin synthesis. Um, so over here, so you block these prostaglandin synthesis. So you're going to end up with a lot of arachidonic acid. If you have a lot of arachidonic acid, it's going to go into this pathway and it's going to make a lot of leukotrienes. That's why um, you can give anti-leukotrienes to prevent uh, aspirin-induced uh, asthma. It's also used for exercise-induced asthma. Side effect is really minimal and I'm not going to take time to talk about it. Um, lastly, a few uh, miscellaneous agents for asthma and COPD. Uh, the first one, which is kind of high yield, is uh, the methyl xanthines. An example of methyl xanthine is theophylline, but also caffeine, like what we drink on uh, an everyday basis, is a class of is an um, a drug that's under the methyl xanthine class. Um, how they work is that uh, these are phosphodiesterase inhibitor. So if you remember uh, cyclic AMP, cyclic AMP is an intracellular signaling that's broken down by phosphodiesterase enzyme. You can give inhibitor to this enzyme like theophylline that will increase cyclic AMP. If you have an increased cyclic AMP, you can cause uh, bronchodilation. So use, um, theophylline is uh, really last line in chronic asthma and COPD uh, treatment. And the reason it's last line, it's because it has a lot of nasty side effects and it's very difficult to dose. It has a narrow therapeutic index, which means the difference between safe and unsafe or safe and toxic is very small. Uh, the side effects mainly are uh, CNS stimulation. So you can have seizures, uh, nervousness and insomnia, um, and that's mainly because of increased uh, cyclic AMP. The biggest one that I would like you to know is seizures. Um, you can have cardiac stimulation because if you have a lot of CMP, you, um, um, that will increase the uh, the heart rate. So you'll you'll have tachycardia and you'll also have arrhythmias. And the third thing that I would like you to be aware of is that it's metabolized by the CYP450 enzymes. So Anytime a medication is metabolized by the CYP450 enzymes, what's going to happen? What is the fear uh, that you have if, uh, if that's the case? Yes, that you'll have a lot of drug interactions. And the main drug interaction that I would like you to be aware of is macrolides. So let's say you give a patient azithromycin and you give patient theophylline, you're going to increase the concentration of uh, theophylline. So that's a test question that uh, test examiners like you to be aware of. Um, so, uh, just to summarize, theophylline, uh, phosphodiesterase inhibitor, bronchodilation, last line, tons of side effects, mainly seizure, tachycardia, and uh, drug interaction. Uh, next is um, a medication uh, called omeluzumab, which is an anti-IgE. Omeluzumab is a monoclonal antibody, and it's given intravenously. Um, how it works is that it binds unbound serum IgE. So if we remember that serum IgE binds to mast cell and cause it to degranulate. So you give this medication and binds to IgE. So it binds to the um, the receptor on the I, uh, on the mast cell, 
and it prevents it to it prevents IgE from binding to it, so it prevents degranulation. It's used in refractory allergic asthma with high IgE levels. So let's say a patient has a specific allergy, let's say to cats or dogs or or pollen or something that has a specific IgE associated with it. Uh, allergists can measure the IgE levels and they can give this medication. Uh, next medication is chromalin, and chromalin is an inhaled medication. Um, and how it works is that it stabilizes mast cells. So it prevents mast cells from being degranulated, and it's used in asthma prophylaxis. Uh, and lastly, uh, the last medication that we're going to talk about uh, is N-acetylcysteine. And N-acetylcysteine is an inhaled medication. Uh, it's mainly used in COPD, and it liquefies thick mucus, because in COPD, the problem is that you have a lot of mucus secretion, and it's very thick. Um, so it relieves congestion, and it's mainly for symptomatic relief. Do you guys remember what other instance is N-acetylcysteine uh, used in? Yes. Uh, Tylenol overdose. It's used intravenously in Tylenol overdose because it repletes glutathione uh, stores. So that's one another uh, use for N-acetylcysteine. So I wanted to kind of bring everything together and talk about how to treat asthma. So we talked about the specific um, specific medications, specific side effects, but really how to treat it from a clinical standpoint. So treatment of asthma is dependent on uh, if the asthma is an acute asthma attack or if it's chronic asthma. For acute asthma attack, the first thing that you want to do, and they may sh this may show up on your exam examinations for um, possibly first step, is that you want to secure the airway. If you see that the patient is, um, is not able to secure their airway, whether they're drowsy or whether they're using accessory muscles, that you want to make sure that's secured, then the answer for that is intubation. Um, the second thing that you want to do is that you, you want to bronchodilate. So how are we going to bronchodilate? The first thing that we give is albuterol, um, and we give it nebulized specifically uh, because uh, in patients that have an acute attack, they're not able to use their inhaler properly. So we give it to them and we help them using a nebulized uh, albuterol. Um, third thing is that we can give oral or IV steroids, so prednisone or methylprednisolone. And again, uh, the results for these is not evident right away, but in the next, you know, 12 to 24 hours, uh, you'll have decreased inflammation. But again, this is not the first priority. Uh, you can give iprotropium for asthma, um, and you can also give IV magnesium. And how IV magnesium works is that it inhibits smooth muscle contraction and inhibits acetylcholine release. But I, what I really want you to remember for acute asthma attack is albuterol, nebulized, and um, oral or IV steroids. Uh, next, for chronic asthma, um, you really want to use a stepwise approach, and the treatment of chronic asthma is dependent on how often the asthma attacks happen. Is it intermittent? Is it persistent? Is it severe? Um, and I put in this table for your reference to differentiate between intermittent, mild, moderate, or severe, uh, but really the treatment for chronic asthma is dependent on two things inhaled corticosteroids, and uh, uh, beta agonists. Uh, it just really depends whether uh, the severity, how much of the corticosteroids you use, and how much of the beta agonists you use. So for intermittent asthma, you want to use just as needed short-acting beta agonists. If it's mild persistent, you give a low-dose inhaled corticosteroids because plus a short-acting beta agonist. For moderate persistent, you up the dose of the corticosteroids and you give a long-acting beta agonist. Uh, for severe persistence, you give a high-dose corticosteroids and a long-acting beta agonist, and you can even consider giving systemic steroids. Um, I'm not sure how high yield this for the step, but I know for the block exam, uh, Last year, they were kind of picky about knowing what is intermittent versus mild versus moderate. Um, and that's why I provided this table for your reference. Uh, for this exam, I'm not sure how picky they're going to be. Um, next, uh, if you have refractory asthma, you can use uh, theophylline. And for allergic asthma, you can use anti-leukotrienes or the omalizumab. Um, the last thing that we're going to talk about is COPD treatment summary. And... 
Um, really, the treatment for COPD is very similar to the treatment. Uh, the treatment of acute COPD is very similar to the treatment of uh, acute asthma. First thing is to secure the airway. Uh, second is to give nebulized albuterol, and that you actually combine it with ipratropium. Uh, you also give oral and IV steroids uh, to decrease the airway uh, inflammation. Um, and lastly, I wanted to kind of uh, bring home a point uh, that will be tested in a lot of step one questions, the use of oxygen in acute COPD exacerbation. So using high levels of oxygen in acute COPD exacerbation may actually lead to respiratory failures. And you'll, actually, you'll see a lot of uh, questions that target that specific concept. Um, so remember that in these patients, the... Well, let me backtrack. Um, what is respiratory drive dependent on in normal patients? In normal patients, re respiratory drive is dependent on hypercapnia. If you have a lot of more CO2, you'll ventilate more. In these patients, the respiratory drive is dependent on hypoxemia. So it's dependent on the oxygen level. If you have low oxygen in the blood, you'll cause ventilation to increase. It's not really dependent on hypercapnia. So if you give oxygen and you blunt this response, if you relieve the hypoxemia uh, by giving high oxygen, you decrease the respiratory drive and patients will crash on you and will end up in respiratory failure. So we don't give high levels of oxygen to patients with COPD exacerbation, just low or immediate uh, levels uh, or medium levels of, uh, of oxygen. So I hope that concept makes sense to you. Um, lastly, uh, for chronic COPD treatment, um, consists of a few things. The first thing is um, you'll notice a lot of patients are in need of continuous oxygen. And these are patients in advanced stages of COPD. Um, continuous oxygen is the only therapy that's proven to decrease mortality in advanced stages of COPD. And that was a test question on last year um, uh, block exam, I believe. Um, next is you can uh, use inhaled uh, corticosteroids and long-acting beta agonists. So example of that is fluticasone and silmiterol. And these treatments are proven to reduce exacerbations, hospitalizations, and mortality. But the mortality is more in the mild and uh, medium stages of COPD. In advanced stages, continu uh, continuous oxygen is what's proven to reduce mortality. Uh, next, uh, you can use long-acting antimuscarinics like teotropium, and that improves the symptoms and the quality of life. You can also use theophylline for advanced COPD, and you can use mucolytics like N-acetylcysteines for symptom relief only. So just to summarize, COPD uh, acutely, uh, you use albuterol and ipratropium and oral or IV steroids, and you avoid using high levels of oxygen. For chronic COPD, continuous oxygen for advanced stages, uh, inhaled corticosteroids, and long-acting beta agonists uh, for uh, chronic treatment, um, and you can also use teotropium or long-acting antimuscarinics and theophylline for advanced uh, COPD. Um, so this is these are the answers to the uh, to the question that I placed uh, earlier. I hope this makes uh, sense to you. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to me uh, or uh, or Mike. And best wishes uh, on your uh, block exam.